Okay, thank you. Um, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Barb Jacobson, coordinator of Basic Income UK, and I'm pleased and honored to be talking with Guy Standing today as we kick off our activities for International Basic Income Week. For many of you, Guy needs no introduction, but for those who don't know his work, Guy is one of the leading advocates for basic income worldwide. He is a founding member of what is now the Basic Income Earth Network, which was set up to explore ideas around and evidence for basic income in 1986. In 2009, Guy headed up a pilot of basic income with the Self-Employed Women's Association and the UN in India, which for many remains the gold standard for testing the idea. In 2011, he published the groundbreaking book, The Precariat, which identified a new class of insecure workers that cuts ac across traditional class boundaries. Other notable titles published since then include The Precariat Charter, Basic Income and How We Can Make It Happen, The Corruption of Capitalism, Why Rentiers and Thrive and Work Does Not Pay, The Plunder of the Commons, and most recently, Battling the Eight Giants, Basic Income Now, which is based on his work for former Ch Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell last year. Guy has spoken to audiences around the world in places ranging from community halls to Davos. In the past few months, of course, he has had many, very many meetings online. So thank you so much, Guy, for coming, for taking the time to speak with us, and I look forward to our conversation. Um, it's a big pleasure. Great, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, there's, uh, I wanted to ask some questions which may not get answered by a lot of your speeches, and um, so we'll go right into the origin story. How, how you've been involved with basic income for 35 years. How did you first come to the idea? I, I first decided that basic income was an essential policy back in the early 1980s. And I was convinced that what Thatcher and Reagan and the neoliberals were doing would usher in a period of growing inequality, <clears throat> growing insecurity, and a new class fragmentation. And it took me some years before I conceptualized the precariat as such, but I was talking about the phenomenon of insecurity back then. And I've been convinced ever since that the idea of a basic income is an absolute essential. And the main reason I support it is ethical, not economic or instrumental. And I, I derive my uh, belief in basic income to the foundational documents of the British Constitution and the foundation documents of all democracies, really. When in November, on November the 6th, 1217, the Magna Carta was sealed in Westminster. It was sealed alongside an equally important document called the Charter of the Forest. And that Charter of the Forest said that everybody had a right to subsistence in the commons. Mm. And the commons should exist to enable everybody to have access to the means to produce subsistence. And it was Im really uh, embedded in English common law and in the principles that for generations have inspired rebellions, have inspired poetry, inspired many uh, subversive movements throughout our history and throughout the history of all struggles for civilization and the rights of humanity. So for me, I, I, I derive my belief way back in the 13th century. Great. I mean, has your, has your thinking about it changed over the years or has it been pretty... Yeah, I common? think the, the, I mean, the, as I say, it's fundamentally ethical. Mm. If you accept private inheritance of private riches, which every government does, and every political party in Britain does, then we should have the same principle for social inheritance. The income and wealth of every one of us is due far more to the efforts and achievements of many generations before us than anything we do ourselves. 
And we are lucky or unlucky in what we inherit. Mm. And I, you can imagine a basic income as a sort of common dividend on the collective wealth. Because we don't know whose ancestors contributed to our wealth and income. And therefore, the only principle that it makes sense, if you accept the idea of public wealth, is that everybody should have an equal common dividend. And I think that principle stands up. If you're religious, then you can say God gave us unequal talents and a basic income is a compensation for those who don't have the talent of making money or a, a super brain. And if you're ecological, then you can say that a basic income is in a sense taking from the polluters to compensate the polluted and that mainly are the poor and disadvantaged in societies. So for me, that ethical grounding is, is fundamental, but it also enhances freedom. Mm -hmm. It enhances two types of freedom. The freedom to say no, the freedom to say no to an exploitive uh, employer or landlord or an oppressive partner for that matter. If you have an individual basic income, you can say no with greater confidence and strength. And it also strengthens uh, liberal freedom, the freedom to be moral. You can't be moral if you're confronted with necessity. I have to do X and Y because I have no choice. You can only have freedom to be moral if you can make decisions. And something like universal credit makes it impossible to be moral. You have to do what the bureaucrats tell you, good or bad, usually bad. But for me, freedom is fundamental and politics on the left and right have neglected the need for real freedom, for full freedom. And the final thing, ethical reason, is that we all need basic security. We all need it mm. as a human need. And the only way to provide everybody with basic security is through a basic income. No other policy that I've heard being presented has the, has the moral authority of a basic income in these three, three respects. But now we're in a pandemic, suddenly basic income has become an economic imperative. We will not out of this pandemic unless we have a basic income as the anchor of a new income distribution uh, system. And that is the theme of my new book, Battling Eight Giants, that you mentioned. Even though it was written beforehand, I said, basically, we are, we are in a stage where we need one shock and all of those eight giants will become overpowering. And that is what we've got today. Right. And we will not get of this pandemic unless governments in Britain and elsewhere move towards a basic income system. Right. Okay, so, so basically the ethical position was the, what you started out with, and obviously you've developed that over the years, yeah? Um, have yeah, you had any influences on that, or who have been your influences? I, any writers or thinkers? I, or I, I mean, we, the standard ones that are mentioned uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in my books and other books as well, you go back to people like Thomas More, Thomas Paine, and, and great figures in history, Bertrand Russell and so on. But as I said earlier, for me, it goes back to the constitutional document, the Charter of the Forest. Mm -hmm. It was one document. It was the, it's extraordinary. It was longer on the British statute books than any other piece of legislation in our history. It was only reformed by a conservative government in 1971. Incredible. Incredible. Wow. And for hundreds of years, it had to be read out in its entirety in every church in England. It's not, it's been forgotten that it was that important. And it had to be read out four times a year. So it, for me, it's, it was a foundational document that inspired the Peasants' Revolt. It inspired many people in the Civil War in the, in the 17th century. And it, 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 it's really embedded in our, our psychology, our culture. And, and it's more important, that document, than any other piece of writing or speechifying or so on. But I'm, I'm extraordinarily pleased that we have had such a distinguished 
number of people down the ages, right the way through uh, history, very distinguished people who've been advocating it. And suddenly now we have a chance of implementing it and we desperately need it. That's for sure. Yeah. Maybe one thing we could do is start demanding that churches actually read it out now again. You know, that would be a great, <laughs> be great. Thing. Yeah. The only problem is that many of the words used in the original have gone out of the English vocabulary. So you'd have to give a modern interpretation. It, it's, it's a beautiful document. But when it talks about the different rights the commoners mm -hmm. have, uh, many of the, the terms would just not be recognized by the modern. Well, um, I'm sure it can be done for sure. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, another question I had, I mean, you've spoken to very elite audiences about basic income, say at Davos and other places. What kind of reaction did you get from them? Or what, well, was there any response? I, I've been, you know, how do they, how do they? I've been, ex yeah. I, I've been ex extraordinarily fortunate, lucky, call it what you like, to have had the chance through my career of putting to test an idea that I've believed in for all that time. You're listening to a person who has had the, the extraordinary experience of being able to test basic income in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, and in, to a certain extent, even in Latin America. That is extraordinary. Mm. For me, lessons of those things have been extraordinarily important. But I've also been invited to talk to precariat audiences in hundreds of places and to the sort of privileged elite that you've just uh, mentioned in Silicon Valley, in Davos, uh, the Bilderberg Group, people that I would never have imagined uh, speaking to and never wanted to, uh, you know, with my particular politics. But they've invited me to talk about why we should have a basic income. And in Davos, three years in a row. So I must have said something wrong to be invited <laughs> back. Uh, but what I've noticed is this. What I've noticed is this. We usually, most of us, are extremely hostile to the plutocracy. Mm. The 1%, whatever you want to call them. We dislike what they stand for. We are furious about their billions of dollars or pounds or whatever that, that they've gained. But not all of them are bastards. Not all of them are evil sods. They're just clever at making money. Hmm. And many of them actually say, and I've spoken to billionaires who've said this, they know that they've made far too much money. They know the system is disgraceful in their favor. And they find it actually uh, morally repugnant. They've told me that, and I believe it. They didn't need to say that. And many of them now have come round to supporting a basic income. Some people on the left say, see, it must be wrong if they are supporting it. That's stupid uh, reasoning. Um, Hitler supported a national health service. Does that mean we should not support a national health service? Of course we should support a national health service. And it's the same with basic income. I don't mind where they come from as long as they support it. And many of them... Um, basically, they say the following. We know that rentier capitalism along the lines of what we've got today is unsustainable. It will lead to fascism and the sort of things that Trump stands for, and it will be unsustainable. It, sustainable capitalism in their mind will only be possible if everybody has the ability to make choices. Sure. Everybody has the ability to function in a market economy. Right. I don't necessarily buy their arguments for capitalism, but I can respect that position. It's not my position, but it's a respectable position. And I think that we should be pleased if a broad church of opinions, different religions, different uh, political identities, or different persuasions of philosophical thought are coming together to support basic income. Mm -hmm. For me, this makes it more likely that it will take place. Other policies are needed, of course they are. But today, 
if we don't have a basic income, we will see the drift to neo-fascist populism gaining ground every single day. That should like, frighten all of us, and we will see extinction rushing towards us. That's the thing, though. I mean, I, I mean, what? So, what are these people with power going to do? That's that's kind of what I was trying to get at there. I mean, if they, well, you know, like, what is their response if they say yes, this is kind of a good idea? You know, we're worried about. We don't want to be in our panic rooms anymore, or you know. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're varying. I mean, yeah. some of them are speaking up. Some of them are putting some of their money into supporting uh, some of the basic income movements. Some of them are, are saying, we, we, them, they need to be taxed more and more of the income generated by the robots and artificial intelligence and so on should be recycled in a basic income. Some of them are coming out openly. I mean, the, the head of the World Economic Forum of Davos is a hundred percent supporter of basic income. He's written, he's said it to me a number of times, he's written it out in public, that he believes that it's essential to have a basic income. And I, I, welcome, I welcome their support. I only wish that the old social democrats, the laborists, the trade unions, would have the courage to do the same. Because at the moment, they are not in the vanguard fighting for a basic income for all. And that's shameful. Right. We should all want every one of us to have basic security. And I cannot respect people who find excuses not to want everybody to have basic income as a right. It right. doesn't make human sense. Yeah, well, there are many of us working on that <laughs> so with the unions. I know, you're doing a great job. You're doing and, a great uh, job, Bob. You know, hopefully we can... Uh, change that in the next year or so um so yeah so you've been invited you know you've been involved with several different pilot projects and so i was just wondering what in your view you think can best be learned from them and what are their limitations basically it's been a bit here for them. I, I hear i hear people in our community the basic income uh, community and in bi uk and a number of other uh, BI communities. We have, we have networks now in over 30 countries. Some of them say we don't need pilots. We should go straight for a basic income. Mm -hmm. Some of them criticize pilots because by definition they are short duration or they have different design limitations. Mm -hmm. I understand those arguments, but I, I would argue that we can learn a lot from piloting, we can learn to deal with what I call the low-hanging fruit. For example, a common prejudice is that a basic income will lead to people doing less work mm. and becoming lazy, they say, right? It will reduce labor supply and therefore it would be a terrible thing. That's what they say. Well, in fact, all the basic income pilots have shown that they result in people either no, making no change whatsoever in their work, or in the case of the really good pilots, they've shown people do more work mm. and are more productive in the work that they do. And they do a greater variety of forms of work, more care work in particular. Right. It is a complete prejudice that a basic income would lead to people doing less work. It's pure prejudice. Right. And a pilot can actually show that. And there are many other things that you learn from pilots, like that we found, for example, huge improvements in nutrition, huge improvements in mental and physical health. In all the different pilots, with all the different methodologies, that result comes through again and again and again. And I've summarized the evidence in, in the Basic Income and How We Can Make It Happen book. Right. And, and we can deal with prejudicial uh, criticisms and I think you can also learn from doing pilots how best to implement mm. a pilot best to implement basic income one of the things we did in our Indian pilots where we provided 6,000 people with basic income and tested by comparing what happened with 6,000 people who were not receiving basic income is we tested for the effect of collective voice mm -hmm. in the 
in Sewa. So we had some communities where Sewa was operating in addition to the basic income, and in some where Sewa was not operating. Right. And I think one of the lessons we should be communicating is that if you implement a basic income, it's often a useful way of maximizing the potential good effects if you enable uh, intermediary organizations to help people learn how best to use their basic income. Right. That sort of thing you can learn by doing pilots, mm -hmm. but we don't need necessarily to have pilots. Right now, I would love to see it being implemented without pilots, but I think actually, if we're pragmatic, I sense that we are more likely to make progress today if we advocate a series of pilots in various parts of Britain where hubs have been developed, where programs for implementation have been developed. And I really get excited when I interact with the groups doing that because these, these people are doing a fantastic job. That is for sure, yeah. I guess, you know, one thing that I would like to see, I guess, is like the government to commit to implementation and then maybe pilot different ways of doing it in different places. I agree. You know, I agree. It's something that the UBI Lab Network, which I'll speak about later, um, has been doing a huge job with. I don't know if you're aware, but I think it's up to seven cities now have called for pilots. And we're looking, hopefully- I think you'll find it's more. I think okay. you'll find it's more. Okay. Every okay. field in Liverpool, you've got a smaller place that's going for it. But but yeah. the, the, the point you've made, Bob, is absolutely right. It, these local initiatives, the hubs, mm. uh, it stir the blood because they are showing enthusiasm for a cause and are activating local people, mobilizing local people. And the next stage is to get more politicians uh, to lose their spaghetti backbones and become more courageous in themselves and local pressure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Lot, yeah, no, it definitely needs a grassroots grassroots push for sure. Uh, just a kind of a problem here is uh, because of the popularity of basic income in recent years, we've seen many cash transfer schemes called basic income, which are patently not basic income. All are means tested, family based, or carry other conditions. What do you think we can do about this guy? Or is there anything we can do about it? Or <laughs> we just have to, you know, because it, it feels a bit weird, you know, you feel like a bit of a nitpicker or a, I don't know, you, you know, if you're sort of constantly, you know, I, I, I know that's not really basic income. Basic income is really like this, you know. So what, what do you think yeah, about I, this? I, 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 I lament the, the fact that. Some people don't do their research, if you like, or don't learn enough, and then bandy the term around uh, like universal basic income when what they're proposing or what they believe in is anything but. And I've, I've been saddened by the fact, for example, when I was first asked to Finland to help in the design of a basic income pilot in Finland, uh, by the Prime Minister's department and the Prime Minister was involved at the time, I urged them to do a proper community-based basic income where every individual, uh, individually, should be paid a basic income because the network effects of everybody in a community receiving it are important. And in the end, because there was um, a right-wing minister from another party in charge of welfare policies at the time and, and finance, they gave just a basic income to 2,000 randomly selected unemployed scattered across the country. Right. The pilot began and ended exactly on time. Many people have been told a lie that it was abandoned, which is completely untrue. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, typical uh, badly researched uh, pseudo journalism. They reported it abandoned. It was never abandoned. It was completed, and has been very properly analysed. I was unhappy with the design, as for reasons I just said, and others. Yeah. And I've written that that criticism before. Uh, but the 
fact is that, in fact, it was successful mm. in one aspect of basic income. And that aspect was you do not need to apply conditionality and pressure on people. People want to improve their lives. 99% of people want to improve their lives. If you give them a modest basic income of 460 euros or whatever it might be per month, that's not going to make everybody sit back and become lazy. Right. They will want to improve their lives and the lives of their family and their children and so on. And there was no reduction in job seeking activity, pursuit of work, developing skills, doing craft work, etc. In, in, in the Finnish experiment. So for me, it was a success of a particular aspect of basic income. And some of the other pilots that I've analyzed in the books were also limited versions. I was involved in a basic income pilot in England, which, was resu which resulted in a television series about a whole group of families who were provided with a basic income instead of other benefits. And I thought at the beginning, I said, this isn't a proper basic income because mm -hmm. you're giving them something. But it turned out, despite my worries, that all of those families improved their lives, mm -hmm. improved their lives. And it was extremely touching. But I, I still would not do that design because it, it, it's very risky. If you give people a lump sum, they could easily squander it, or, and then suddenly they, they'd be in the streets or, or back to the, their, their problem lives. You have to do it a modest basic income paid each month without the conditions and let people learn and adapt to that situation. And I think it's important the design, but as it happens, all of the pilots that I've discussed in the book, and there are quite a lot, have actually had really good positive effects. Mm -hmm. Great. But what about like, you know, say like in Spain, they, uh, the press kind of called their scheme for COVID uh, a basic income, or I've heard it also banding about around Germany, or uh, say Trump's one one check that he gave people, right? You know, like that that kind of thing, where I I can just see kind of governments kind of just calling any old improvement to the scheme a basic income. I mean, one thing that was good. Sorry, just I want to say one thing that was really good about Finland was that they also tested uh, they tested the the less conditional money against the last year against uh, the a benefit that has conditions like like uh, universal credit. And they found actu actually that people on the basic income worked more. It was not a lot more, but they worked, they certainly worked more than the, than the so-called activation, uh, activation benefit that they had, right? So for me, that's a really good, you know, like, They've already, you know, so they've basically proven that all these activate, you know, so-called activation policies in terms of welfare, you know, pe people getting so-called activated to, to look for work, which is basically they're prodded into looking for work, that they actually work, they don't work as well. Um, let me, let me, let me respond to that, Bob, because sure. I, I, I want to make one point, which is not often made. If you, if you found that putting people into slavery resulted in them having better nutrition and working harder, would you support putting people into slavery? Of course not. Mm. Okay. I would object to the conditionality and the punitive sanctions of universal credit, even if Ian Duncan Smith could say that it raised employment. Okay. I find it morally repugnant mm. to force people to do things that they don't choose to do and to punish them without due process, without any respect for common law and due process enshrined in the Magna Carta, where they are found guilty by somebody who has no legal training and are punished without any proper representation or legal process. Even if they could show, which I don't think they can for a second, 
no. that this resulted in increased employment, I would still say it should end tomorrow morning. It is disgraceful. Right. It's immoral. And any social policy that is immoral is ipso facto wrong. Right. And we just keep saying that. Um, so for me, conditionality is a dead end of a free society. It should not be tolerated. Well, certainly. And I mean, in Spain, the, the scheme collapsed, didn't it? The, uh, the national well, the, 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 the Spanish, the yeah. Spanish scheme. I, I wrote some articles in in their main newspaper, El País, mm. and and they invited me to. It was it was really a crazy scheme. Uh, 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 really, it was very bizarre because here you are in the middle of a pandemic, where millions of Spaniards have suddenly found they've lost their incomes, they've lost their savings, they are in danger of losing everything. And you introduce a means-tested household-based scheme that bases the payment on the household's income last year mm. before the pandemic struck. I mean, you can't get more stupid than that because, of course, that is no guide to the people who have been plunged into poverty this year as a result of the pandemic. And it only reaches a very small uh, percentage of, yeah. of households. And many of the households that exist today didn't exist back then. They've become dissolved because of the pandemic effects. And so on. So there are, there's so many things wrong with the, the Spanish scheme. But the incredible thing was uh, numerous journalists and politicians around the world described it as a basic income si system. I got, I got a huge number of uh, newspapers and TV channels, radio channels from around the world, ask me, what do you think of the basic income scheme in, in Spain? And I said, well, it isn't a basic income scheme. They said, what? The government says it's a basic income. And, you know, and it, it became ridiculous. So we've got, to, we've got to continue with our dialogue with ourselves to make sure that we communicate to everybody what a basic income scheme is, right? Right. It is a modest payment to every individual in the country. And it's a modest payment unconditionally, paid regularly, it's non-withdrawable. Regardless of your work status, regardless of your gender, your marital status, and so on. Mm. And notice, I never use the term universal basic income. Mm -hmm. I do not use the term universal because... For practical political reasons, we are going to have to say that certain people would not qualify to receive the basic income. For pragmatic reasons, we would have to say, for example, that new migrants to the country would have to wait for a period before they start receiving or being entitled to a basic income. Otherwise, we're going to have this famous welfare tourism and so on, and we have no chance of being of getting the system into, into reality. That's not to say we should give no help to migrants and refugees. Of course, we should be giving help, but they should be given help in a different, separate set of policies, not under the basic income. And similarly, you wouldn't want to give it to every citizen who was living outside and working outside the country. So somebody like myself who works in Europe would not be entitled to the British basic income unless I were living in Britain, which I'm not, okay? So you would have to put certain constraints on who is entitled. That's why I prefer not to use the term universal. If it, if it made more sense to people, I would say quasi-universal because the idea of universal and equality is mm. fundamental to what we're, what we're proposing. But for practical reasons, one has to have those sort of constraints. Okay, great. I mean, one thing I always say to this, you know, because then the other, the other thing that you get is, well, all these people are going to rush in here. And the example I always give is the, is the Alaska dividend, all right? You know, anybody from the U.S. can move to Alaska, but you do have to live there for a year before you can get it. And it's not actually resulted in 
millions of people moving up to Alaska, although we'll see with the, uh, with the current, current situation in the U.S., which is pretty bad. Um, yeah, I think I would want to go further. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> quite grateful to be here in London right now, that's for sure. Okay, yeah, so, right, so we've had this big flowering of the movement in the last six years, and now with COVID especially, we've got lots of groups that have been forming to campaign, you know, for basic income around the world. Uh, we kind of talked about this a little, a little bit earlier, but um, what, what do you think our focus should be? I mean, obviously, you know, some, some groups are demanding pilots, other people are demanding full imp implementation, other people, you know, and then you get the kind of second layer of that, which is, you know, it's not worth having a basic income unless it's enough to live on. All right, so where are you in that, in that mix there? I, I've always believed that we should be on a journey. I've always believed that the most important thing in the reform of social policy is that whatever reforms are made or supported by us in the movement should be on the road to a basic income, not away from it. Therefore, for example, universal credit is abominable mm. because it's charged really far in the other direction. I would much prefer to see a modest uh, basic income that was less than subsistence or less than the level we would like being introduced than a higher level conditionality punitive system of the universal credit direction. Mm. I believe we have to look at this today in two time dimensions. We have to look at it as an urgent need for something like an emergency basic income mm -hmm. for as long as the pandemic uh, is in full flow. We need to use budget deficit. We used, need to use uh, fiscal measures to pay for such a basic income. I've been criticizing the furlough scheme. I think the furlough scheme is disgraceful. It's yeah. gone in the yeah. direction. It's giving, it's very, very regressive. Mm. It's not supporting the carry out. And it, it's wasting a lot of the money that could have been used to give everybody a, a basic income of modest amounts. Mm. And it's important that that principle is understood because there's one lesson we're learning. And I, I tell this to every journalist who contacts me. The resilience of all of us the resilience of society will depend on the resilience of the most weak and vulnerable in society. We will not get out of this pandemic if groups are left insecure and vulnerable and impoverished. And if that lesson is not obvious, then it's sad. And I think we have to keep hammering away at that point. That was the theme behind the video I did with Massive Attack. And, and I think that that is understood by millions of people. It's, it's obvious when you think about it, but the politicians are still constructing a bring back yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. which won't work. It will increase inequality. It will increase the size of the precariat. It will increase the probability there will be third waves, fourth waves of the pandemic and the growth of deaths of despair, homelessness, and the yeah. banks that are shooting up. All of those negative things that we've seen in the decade of austerity will be intensified. Right. And I think it's our responsibility, Bob, not just you and me, but all of us, mm. in this movement, an incipient, nascent movement. We've got to do our bit, and we've got to demand that more politicians have the courage to stand up. I cannot tell you, and I know you have the same experience, I cannot tell you how many leading politicians across the spectrum have told me in private that they believe in basic income, but they don't know how to come out. Oh, right. It's like a homosexual issue of 20 years ago. And, and it really is shameful that they, if they claim to believe in something, then they should come out. And well, I, I mean, think what we've got to do is to encourage more of them to have courage. 
that's the thing. I mean, I think, you know, we really need, you know, it's the grassroots movement that's developing, I think, which will actually finally press that. You know, it was a bit like that, that quote from Roosevelt, you know, well, yeah, I agree with everything yep. you say, now make me do it. Okay, I think we're kind that's of right. at that stage right now. So yeah, finally, this will be my final question and then we'll get to some questions from the audience. Um, I, I'm curious, like what, what dangers do you see for basic income in the future? Like, do you see any dangers if it's implemented or, you know, obviously there are opportunities, there will be opportunities for everybody if, they, if it is, but I don't know, in terms of, I like some people have raised think questions like data mining or, you know, that there will be a condition like you have to get a vaccine or, you know what I mean? It, there, people have kind of raised, you know, have sometimes raised oh. issues that, that it could be used more to control us than to give us freedom. I, I, I know that sort of objection, and I've addressed it in, in the books uh, when discussing the objections. I, I, I like to use the metaphor that you can't win a game of golf with only one club. <laughs> Okay. Basic income is not a panacea. It doesn't solve all society's problems or pretend to solve all society's problems. It must be seen as one component of a new progressive politics. We need protection of privacy. We need protection of our public services. We need protection to decommodify our education system. All of the things that affect the precariat require progressive counter policies to, to beat the trends. But I will say that without basic income, society will be much less likely to have the collective strength to confront those other challenges and I think they can be defeated as long as we address them from a position where everybody has involvement in society and having a basic income will increase the sense of social integration, social solidarity. We've seen that in the pilots. We've seen an increase in social solidarity within communities. And that is a powerful positive uh, learned from pilots. And I, I think that the dangers are that we will see the old center left, the old laborists, resisting a basic income with phony reasoning about it endangering other things. And therefore, we're going to lose everything. We have seen loss through austerity. We have seen a loss of civil rights and economic rights. It wasn't the basic income that lost those, those rights. It was the fact that millions of people are vulnerable and angry and anomic and alienated. And that is the problem. And if you don't have a basic income system, that degree of alienation and anomie will continue to grow. And I think that the left has a responsibility to itself. Otherwise, it's going to continue to lose and lose and lose and lose. But so, okay, so then what's you, this is kind of a question from our, from our um, chat room. I, what if the right introduces a basic income? I mean, I personally, I think it's very possible. So, are it, I, uh, I think that the left has to wake up to its own responsibilities. Mm. If, if right were wise enough to introduce a basic income, they will deserve the popularity that is likely to follow. Mm. I don't wish the right to get that popularity. But the point is that if the left doesn't move to give people a right to economic security, and the right did, then the right would deserve to get the applause. And, and that's why I say to the left, why are you hanging back? Why are you not advocating that every person in our country should have basic security? Mm. Because that's responsibility. If you call yourself a left, you should believe in egalitarianism. You should believe in freedom for all. And if you don't go in that direction and the right does, then you deserve what comes next. I, I, I mean, that is how fundamental it is. But I don't believe that the right will do it because they believe in privilege. They believe in maintaining people in fear and in security. They believe 
that mm. that's how society should be organized. Privilege should have privilege. So, so I don't expect them to do that, but I, I think that if they were to do it, that would show, wow, they've suddenly got common sense. Hmm. Well, I mean, it surely, I mean, we also see the right that, you know, this government has done anything but basic income. You know, we had the of restaurant course. scheme, we had, you know, as well as furlough and Crazy. other bits and pieces of money that have been handed out, you know, to businesses. And I mean, you know, what people forget is that, you know, the largest portion went to those with the most, whether that was the furlough scheme right. or whether that was the corporate bailouts or whatever. Uh, we have a question here about uh, UBI and, and UBS. Um, we usually talk about these together. We, what do you think? What's, how, how's that discussion going at the moment? The, you you're know, me. like basic income and, and basic services. You're asking me. Yeah, I'm asking you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I, I, I think, I, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing my words as carefully as I can. Sure. I have appendix in my Battling Eight Giants book saying why UBS is not a viable principle uh, strategy. I find it almost fraudulent. They claim in their major book, report, whatever you want to call it, that they believe in universal basic services is better than universal basic income. I leave aside the word universal basic income, universal. Mm. What they proposed was that they should have basic food, mm. basic food, right? Imagine, imagine everybody having access to basic food. What food? I don't know what food it would be. But when you read their report, actually, they were saying that there should be one free meal a day for the lowest 40% or whatever it was of income earners per day. I'm not sure whether it would be breakfast, lunch or dinner, but they said that. And of course, if it's only for 40%, then obviously it's not universal. It's just that's, that's I is the meaning. It's a means tested system. So it's not universal at all. Mm -hmm. And what's Things should be a basic service. Well, they, when they get to transport, they say buses. Well, supposing you don't take a bus and you go by bicycle. Why should somebody who takes a bus, which is polluting, get a subsidy where you don't get a subsidy if you go by bicycle? Mm. Or you go by train or by tube. Why only buses? And once you go down that road, you get more and more to realize that it's just a paternalistic thing where people, the bureaucrats, would determine what you need. Right. And the difference between the people who propose UBS is that they say they know what we need and we will deliver it. How nice of them. Very kind. Whereas a basic income person says, I don't know what you need, but I do believe that you should have the resources to pursue what you think you need. There's a different philosophical way of thinking about social policy. And for me, UBS is, is uh, almost fraudulent. I believe in good public services. Mm -hmm. I believe that we should have nationalized water. I believe we, an a NHS should be made much more of what, it was originally conceived to be. We need privatization removed. Mm. We need good public education. We need good public services of care and so on. We need all of those things. We need investment in those things. But it's not an alternative to giving people freedom and security. Mm. You don't get security from having a free bus pass. You only get freedom if you have the guarantee of access to resources to pursue what you think you need. Right. That's called freedom. Right. And for me, the, the two should not be contrasted. One is a way of looking at public services. Another is about giving people freedom and security. Okay, thanks. Um, right, so a question has come up about job guarantee. Um, again, you know, like all these things that, that, that are kind of put in opposition 
to each other. I, I, you know, I would like just to see, personally, I'd like to see the money given first and then we can decide also what jobs actually need to be done or what services need to be provided, you know. But what do you think of, what, do you, what are your thoughts about job guarantee? Because that's a big uh, topic in the States. Um, as it happened, I was interviewed by uh, uh, the New York Times on, on this one. And, yeah. and I think, I think uh, it's, it's, it's close to madness. Uh, the idea of giving everybody a guaranteed job. When you open the box, you say, well, what job are you guaranteeing me? Mm. I would like to be a president of the United States instead of the president of the company. <laughs> Can you guarantee me that job? Mm. Oh, you can't. Well, what job is it you're guaranteeing me? Okay. Mm. First, what would it be? Cleaning public toilets? Cleaning the roads? What job? Or would you give me a job, guaranteed job, what I'm doing, I'm an economist, I, I'm right, and I'm advocating basic income. Are you going to guarantee me that job? What job are you going to guarantee? And second, what happens to the people who are already doing those jobs? Whatever job you say you're going to guarantee. If you guarantee all the unemployed a job in a cafe, in cafes, as a waitress or a cook, what happens to all those people who are doing those jobs at the moment? What would happen is their wages would be driven down, their working conditions would be driven down, and there would be substitution for those people already doing those jobs. Okay, what if you do it and you say, well, we need more care workers, and therefore you were given guaranteed jobs as care work, okay? Well, if you give a guaranteed job, then you don't need to do it well. I can turn up late, I can do a lousy job, I can stop actually caring for the, the, the old person who I'm meant to be caring for, but you've guaranteed me a job. And therefore, I can keep that job. Or if you tip me out of that job, I have to be guaranteed another job. And it would very quickly lead to workfare and to punitive sanctions and all of the things that we hate in universal credit. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a phony thing. It sounds good when you first say it. Wow. In fact, I would love to be guaranteed no jobs. <laughs> Our mutual friend, David Graeber, right. David Graeber rightly wrote about bullshit jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And I have written the same. Many people do jobs they would hate to do for very long. And I don't think the idea of guaranteeing jobs, I think it would be a great thing if automation resulted in no jobs for today's toilet cleaners. Hmm. You know, it was automated out of existence. Oh dear, there would be fewer jobs. Hmm. Right. The need is to make sure that people can be able to pursue their own life, their own work enthusiasms, develop themselves, experiment in their work. But the idea of a job guarantee is alien to that alien to that. Very soon, great artists who spent periods out of jobs would be penalized. They would be forced to take a job. Mm. Can you imagine if Michelangelo had been forced to take a job? We'd never have the wonderful artistic creations that he produced. So for me, it's a wrong, it's a, it's a wrong end. It's anti-freedom. And it certainly doesn't respect the spirit of David. Right. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so we have a question, or in fact, we have two questions now about, um, one is like, how do we link the struggle of basic income to housing issues, but also a related one is that, you know, and it's certainly something I hear often on when I'm speaking about it, is that, uh, that basic income will just be taken as rent by landlords. Um, my answer to that usually is, well, they've been raising rents without raising income for what 30 40 years or something okay so they don't they certainly don't need a basic income to uh you know to raise the rents that's for sure but what do you think about the you know about housing you know trying to link it goes, it goes back it goes yeah. back it goes back i agree with what you said bob I, I totally agree they've been doing those things anyhow mm -hmm. uh and it the lack of a basic income certainly hasn't stopped them doing that. The spread of landlordism, 
has been a phenomenal, uh, terrible phenomenon since Thatcher privatized uh, council housing. And, and it's got worse and worse. I go back to my metaphor. Uh, you can't win a game of golf with only one club. We need proper housing policies. Mm. We need controls. We need to have the construction of more social housing. We need to control the uh, filthy conditions that landlords are able to get away with. We need to uh, deprivatize student accommodation, etc. The, these are these are fundamental needs. I've, I've discussed them in the Plunder of the Commons, my book on that. We need we need, for example, to get finance out of uh, private housing and student accommodation. It's really, it's abominable that Goldman Sachs, one of the, the biggest financial institutions, is effectively the biggest uh, landlord for our students across the country. I mean, it, it should be regarded as just not acceptable. I think that that is separate. We are, we are, those of us in the, in the basic income movement have always said that housing policy and housing benefits have to be treated separately from basic income. And, and I think that that continues to be the mainstream position of most of us uh, in yeah. the movement. For sure. Okay, another question. Um, does uh, basic income discriminate against the disabled? I mean, I know that you've tried to deal with this question in various levels, but what, what would you say to that right now? I, I, I want to make it, I got a similar email from what you just said this morning. Somebody saying you, that I was proposing that everybody, everybody with disabilities just get 75 pounds a month or a week. But the statement was exactly complete nonsense. I've never said anything of the sort. I believe that the, the concept of a basic income is that everybody has equal basic security and equal basic material access. Okay? Mm. People with disabilities have higher costs of living than those people without disabilities. And they have a lower probability of being able to earn income. Ergo, they should have a higher level of benefits than other people. I believe that two points are vital in this. First, everybody should have a basic income. And second, everybody with disability, regardless of means tests, throw them out, should have benefits for their disability and those should be separate and the the governance of the disability benefits system should be dominated by the organizations representing people with disabilities i think it's wrong that the bureaucrats can apply tests behavioral tests means tests and things for determining who gets a benefit or their disability. I think that should be taken out of the main stream of social policy and treated as separate and be left to be the dominated by people with disabilities mm. and their organizations. So for me, it's a matter of saying that disability benefits should be separate from and in addition to basic income. And that is my position. Listen, uh, Guy, thank you so much for talking with us and making time for this discussion. Uh, because of the short time, I'm sorry we didn't get to many of the questions that we had from our audience. Um, if you'd like to get involved with the basic income movement, you can find most national groups on the BN website at basicincome.org. Basicincomeweek.org shows activities you can participate in this week uh, in various places in the world. And basicincomemarch.com is geared towards next Saturday, 19th of September, when people in over 45 cities around the world will be taking to the streets in a variety of ways to get our message out. In Europe, we have uh, Unconditional Basic Income Europe, which you can find at ubie.eu, uh, I think, or .org, sorry, I've lost the, <laughs> I've forgotten the thing. And then also on the 25th of September, um, a new European Citizens Initiative for Unconditional Basic Income 
will be starting and uh, that will last for a year and they have to collect a million signatures. So please uh, direct any of your European friends to eci-ubi.eu in order to support that. If you're from the UK or if you're here in the UK, you can sign up for our newsletter at basicincome.org.uk or get involved with the UBI Lab Network of local and sectoral groups at ubilabnetwork.org. Citizens Basic Income Trust, which is the oldest basic income group in the, in the UK, is uh, they have a wealth of information and research about basic income, and you can find them at citizensincome.org. Finally, our newest organization here in the UK is called the Basic Income Conversation, which is run out of Compass. And uh, you can find them there. They're developing a toolkit for having conversations about basic incomes in any kind of community you find yourself in, whether that's your family, your workplace, um, other, you know, any other kind of community groups that you might be involved with, because we really want to get this out. And you, could, um, you can find them at basicincomeconversation.org. So again, at least, uh, yeah, I'm left to say, Guy, thank you so much for speaking with us and for your continuing work to promote basic income and get it implemented. <laughs> All right. I think it's really important that we make a big push now uh, you know, to actually get this implemented. Talk to as many people as you can. If you, you know, have a political bent, then you know, please get in touch with both your local and national politicians and say this is the thing that we really need now. It was interesting on a call I was on a few weeks ago, there was a, 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 a liberal politician actually, who just like, you know, stood out and said, well, we haven't talked about death, all right? People are gonna die. <laughs> and actually, I mean, I'm sorry, but that is really the situation that we're in right now in the world. And, you know, without a basic income, it's gonna be very difficult to, uh, to overcome that. One last thing, uh, we've had a message from Canada. Uh, there will be a webinar in Canada. Uh, they're also uh, organizing incredibly for basic income there. Um, with different, again, different local and sectoral groups. So if you go to Basic Income Canada Network, then uh, you can find the things there. So again, Guy, thank you so much for joining us. Um, do you have any last words before before we stop this? Or Well, I, I, if anybody has five minutes to spare and want to have a, an amusing piece of music, uh, I, would, I would say go into Massive Attack, the video they made with me, about basic income that's gone all viral around the world in various languages and it sort of summarizes my position today and the reactions i've had to it from all over the world have been fantastic and i just want to end by wishing everybody listening to this including those whose questions have not been answered i wish you great strength and really hope you can help because it's up to us all of us thank you very much Great. Thank you so much, Guy.